wanted to prove to my parents that their sacrifices were worth it. Um, and I don't know, my sister and my brother, they were not the same way. I, I mean, my parents always used to say that I was the easy kid, like growing up in high school and stuff, but I, I just always had that instilled in me that I really wanted to make my parents proud. So, um, ever since I was a little girl, uh, my mom and my dad told me that I would one day grow up to be a news anchor. I don't know why they chose that profession for me, but when they found out they were having another girl, they wanted her to be a news anchor. And my dad told me that, you know, where we're from in Korea, anchor women are very highly revered and respected. It shows that they're intelligent, and that's what we want you to do. So I remember watching Channel 18 Korean News in LA um, over cartoons growing up, okay? So I had like, I was five years old, I had like a little microphone and a little business suit and I would like practice pretending to be an anchor woman from a, from a young age. So being the Korean daughter, wanting to make my parents proud, you know, I studied really hard in high school and I was a pretty good student. You know, the SATs, my SATs, it was based off of like the 1600 score back then. It's like 2400 now, right? Could they change that? Or is it still? Oh, it's back to 1600? Okay, well, my score was like, out of my, I'll just tell you guys what my score was. I got a 1410 from like, in my high school, like that was like not considered a very good score. I thought it was a pretty good score, but like in my high school, it was like, you know, average. Anyways, so like a good Korean American daughter, I decided I'm gonna do what makes my parents proud. My parents want me to become a journalist, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I applied to journalism school out of high school because I just really had no idea what I wanted to do. So surprisingly, I was accepted um, into what I think is one of the best journalism schools in the country, the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, for Trojans. So this was the first time in my life where I became like very hyper aware of my Asianness or my minority status. Suddenly, I was in a class with people of all different cultures and nationalities. Again, you know, my high school was 70% Asian. I want to say you know, there were in my you know high school classes of 25 to 30 students, maybe five students who were not Asian in that class. So. You know, I was often the only Korean American in my classes, and I found out that I really loved it because for the first time I felt like I had a unique perspective I could offer. You know, my experience was different from my classmates when I was in college. So um, it, it was then that for the first time I kind of understood the responsibility that I had, not only as a budding journalist, but as a budding um, Korean American journalist. And my first real life experience with this came at my very first internship. So it was the summer, I believe, before my junior year in college, and I landed my dream internship. Okay, this was my dream internship. It was at the local NBC station in Los Angeles, KNBC, and I was interning in the special projects and investigative unit. So back then, you know, I was incredibly shy and nervous and really timid, and I was just sort of in awe of all of the people that I was lucky enough to work alongside. And these were people that I grew up watching on the news. Um, and mind you, I was not the best on-air reporter in my graduate class, okay? I was not, I honestly am so sometimes shocked by how far I have come in my career. Um, and let that be an encouragement to all of you that if you really want something, you really can't look at it, and I know that that sounds trite, but I really do believe that um, in my heart. So I was not naturally talented or gifted, um, but I worked really hard, and for me, I'm a woman of faith, so I knew that you know I had God in my corner who was really pushing me and uh, you know making sure that I was gonna be okay. So during my internship, I happened to work under a producer who was very supportive and encouraging, and she wanted me to pitch my own story. So kind of piggybacking off of what Jim was saying about scholarships and opportunities to intern with you know, different various Korean American organizations, I would highly recommend you guys do that. Because I did that. I was interning at the same time that I was interning at KNBC in Los Angeles. I was also interning for the local chapter of the Korean American Coalition. And I would really just do volunteer work when they had events or galas. I would, you know, volunteer at the setup desk and pass out main tags and whatnot. Um, but while I was interning there, I had heard from a couple of 
organizers that they were really trying to push um, this issue of um, so-called comfort women in your career. Are you guys aware of that history? Okay, so for those of you who are not, you know, these women were young, Korean and Chinese women um, and girls, sometimes as young as 14, who were forced into uh, sexual slavery from four Japanese troops during World War II. So these women were often kidnapped or deceived. You know, they were promised jobs working in factories, and then they willingly left with people who would, in turn, sell them um, into sexual slavery. So for years and years, uh, these comfort women demanded a formal apology from the, the government of Japan today. Um, many of the former sex slaves, you know, this day and age, they're old. Many of them are passing on, and so time was running out. So I thought this would be such a compelling story for KNBC. I was like, how, I don't know how the heck I'm going to get it on the air, but this is a compelling story. Again, you know, we have the largest population of Korean people outside of Korea. How, how am I going to make this happen? And so, um, you know, Congress at the time was was uh, deliberating a bill, or not a bill, but it was House Resolution 121, um, which urged the Japanese government to apologize um, for the Imperial Armed Forces behavior of forcing these women into sexual slavery. And so I thought, okay, there's my news pen. Okay, this is now timely because Congress might pass this resolution, and that means the U.S. government potentially could be back in this issue, which would be huge. So I researched and researched, I made so many calls. My internship, folks, was unpaid. So I honestly was like living off of my parents that summer and it was driving really far in LA traffic, like two hours each way to get to this internship where I was, again, not being paid. Um, and I was finally able to find a former comfort woman. And this was through all of those connections that I made at my other internship or volunteer opportunity with the Korean American Coalition. So she was such a cute old time lady um, who only spoke Korean. She agreed to do an on-camera interview uh, with us through a translator. And for me, at that young age, it was such a deeply moving experience to have to sit in on this interview and listen to this woman um, speak in you know the language that I was taught as a really young girl um, and speak about her experiences. And when she left the station, and she, like I'll never forget this moment. She like turned and looked at me, and she told me in Korean, you know, I'm just so proud of you. And for me, it was such a humbling experience because I thought I didn't I didn't do anything. Um, but you know, it was one of those experiences that really shaped, and it just like clicked in my brain. Like this is why I am meant to do this. You know, as an Asian American, as a Korean American, I have a very unique voice, and here is a platform. You know that I can get. I have the opportunity to advocate for stories that are really important to our community. And so that story ended up airing in July of 2006, I believe. Some of you guys were three or four years old. Um, later, I found out that story was nominated for a local Emmy Award, which was kind of crazy. And my producer put my name on it as an associate producer. So at 18 years old, um, still in college, I was nominated for my first Emmy Award uh, for a story that I helped tell. And most importantly, um, US House Resolution 121 ended up passing. And in 2005, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe offered his sincerest apologies to all former comfort women, and Tokyo provided about nine million dollars to help fund uh, for a fund to help the victims who were still with us. So I share this story because I want you all to know that whatever your passion is, whether it is journalism or business or medicine, um, you have a very unique story. You have a very unique perspective, just being who you are, just being born into your circumstance. Whether it is you are Asian American or Korean American or adopted or whatever that might be, you have a very unique experience just being alive and just being, you know, within, born into the families that you guys are born into. So once you find out whatever that passion is, there will be opportunities for you uh, to share or bring awareness to the causes that matter to your community. So uh, if an inexperienced college student can do it, so can you. So I would encourage you to look for all of those opportunities, go after them no matter how daunting it might be. Um, it's something that I'm still learning every day. So I started at NBC Chicago uh, almost three years ago, and it's like almost full circle for me, right? You know, I started as an intern at the local NBC station in my hotel in Los Angeles, and now here I am, you know, working in Market 3 as an on-air reporter. I mean, it's sometimes like I just pinch myself thinking, I don't know how the heck this happened to me. 
Um, but, you know, I work for one of the best broadcast companies in the country, if not the world, and so I know every day how lucky I am. Um, and again, just to encourage you guys, for my first job when I graduated from college in 2009, this was at the height of the Great Recession. I don't know if you guys remember that time, but it was a dark time. Um, there were not jobs, especially for journalists. I, I sent out like 120 resumes all over the country. It took me five months to land my first job. Uh, I was paid $20,000. That's like below minimum wage. My parents had to help me out with my, first, with my car payment. It was, it was a dark time, but like those experiences were worth it. So for those of you guys who want to get into journalism, we can have another conversation. I can you know, walk you through all the, the little steps, but you know, <laughs> I went from intern to news reporter in Lansing, Michigan, then I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and now here I am in Chicago. Uh, I feel very lucky to be here, and you know, it's one of the greatest honors of my life, really, to you know, work in this great city and cover the surrounding suburbs. You know, I've visited countless Chicago neighborhoods, I've been invited into people's homes, I've been invited to speak to students like you. Um, and so last year, I, I have been what we call a street reporter covering crime, covering weather. I've been standing outside on the highway in a snowstorm talking about road conditions. So I've been, I covered all of that for about two and a half years. And then last year, there was an unexpected opening in our station's um, investigative unit. And so I had done investigative work in my previous job in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is another one of those, um, if you've seen an opportunity, have to take it again no matter in what field you decide to pursue if you've seen opportunity you, you try to take it um, so I was like a cover I'm still considered a cub reporter at NBC Chicago you know I am working alongside reporters who have been doing this at NBC longer than I have been alive okay that is like mind-blowing to me um, so I thought okay, there's no way that they're going to consider me for this investigative job, but I, you know, I want it. I think that I could do a good job at it. So I'm just going to ask. So I saw the opportunity. I approached my bosses about it. You know, I had, um, you know, it's, I think that they noticed as a general assignment reporter, the hard work and the effort that I put into it. So, you know, they decided, oh, why not? I'm just going to take a chance on her. So I've been working in the investigative unit now. Uh, it's, you know, a bit of a promotion for me um, for about a year. And I, I really, truly believe that I'm working alongside the best reporters in the market. And again, I know I'm hammering this point home, but some days I still can't believe it. So a few months ago, uh, it was another similar opportunity that I saw. Um, and I knew that I had to at least try for it. And I, I want you guys to remember what I told you guys a couple minutes ago, that like when I first started in this industry, I was a really shy and timid person. And sometimes I still feel like that. Like when I walk into a big newsroom in a city like sh Chicago, I think, oh my gosh, I am so undeserving to be here. But you know, you just, you gotta push through all of your insecurities and just try to make it work. And so. A few months ago, I saw another opportunity and I had to at least try for it. As you all know, NBC News is the broadcast partner um, for the Olympics. Uh, NBC Chicago usually sends one reporter and one photographer to wherever the Olympics are held. Um, last year, or for the real games um, in 2016, the summer games, we sent um, our talented sports anchor, Seattle Lewis, and a photographer to uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, and it's a covenant assignment because you're, you're witnessing history. You, know, you are gone for like three weeks, well, technically a whole month because you leave before the games begin, the games are two and a half weeks long, and you cover it all. Um, and you try to find those local Chicago angles. Um, and if you guys don't know, in 2018, the Winter Games are in Pyeongchang, South Korea. And I thought, Oh my lord, I need to try at least. I mean, I'm, I'm the station's only Korean American reporter or anchor, and so I, I need to try for it at least and, and make it known to my bosses that I'm interested in this, because if I, if I don't at least express my interest, I'm going to regret it. You know, Korea, that's where my parents are from. Um, so much of my identity is tied to Korea, and so even though I had recently moved into the investigative unit, even though I had only been at the station about three years, you know, I just made the case to my bosses. Like, this would mean so much to my family. 
uh, and to me to be able to go and cover the games. And I just, I need, I need you to consider and at least give me a shot. So today I'm happy and very honored to tell you guys that I'm going to Pyeongchang in uh, You know, remember when I first got the job offer in Chicago three years ago, um, my dad and I talked about it. You know, we knew obviously that NBC is a company that, that is the broadcast partner for the Olympics and we knew that in 2018 um, the Olympics were going to be in Korea and I thought, okay, at that point when 2018 hits, I'll have been at the station for four years. Maybe in those four years time I will be able to have proved myself that I can do this, I can cover this assignment. And so it really is uh, a dream that I'm able to do this and it's such a huge honor to be able to go and report in a country like Korea where again, you know, even though I've only been there a handful of times, it really, um, so much of who I am is tied to that country because that's where my parents are from. So, you know, my career has literally taken me all across the country. If you told me in high school as a sheltered uh, Korean American living in Southern California, um, which is a, such a bubble that I would have moved around like I have, I would really literally have left it off. But here I am, and if you are very lucky to grow up in communities um, that are extremely diverse, and I'm sure, you know, you do feel like you are a minority some of your communities and schools and neighborhoods, but I would say that's a good thing. Embrace that. Uh, embrace that diversity. Learn from people who are different from you, and then also be proud to share about who you are. Because again, you have such a unique voice, um, no matter what you want to pursue. And I know that we're at the uh, Global Young Leadership Conference, but I, I would really challenge you guys to, to think about what global means to you. Like what, what kind of leader and in what kind of setting do you want to be? For me, I sort of define global as I'm happy here in a community. You know, a lot of times, like the, the dream of a lot of journalists, as well as television journalists, is to make it to the network level. You know, so to be able to report on NBC Nightly News with less reports. Um, and folks ask a lot, I mean, do you ever want to go to the network level? And first of all, I mean, though there are very few jobs at the network level, you have to be such a talented journalist to make it there. I don't know if I have the skills to, to be able to one day make it there, but honestly, even if I was lucky enough to have that opportunity, I, I am so happy to be in a city like Chicago. I always thought to myself that for me, the peak would be when I made it to a big city and reporting in a community because there, there, that is when you can really get involved uh, in a certain community to volunteer and whether or not you know I am making a difference with the stories that I'm telling I know that there are opportunities out there you know and I I, I really truly feel like uh, my experience as an intern in college is a true testament to that that there are opportunities out there we just have to look for them um, and we have to be brave enough to pursue them uh, when they happen upon our, you know, fall right in front of our face. So with that, do you guys have any questions? I think I need to be wrapped up soon, but do you guys have any questions? Um, if you guys are, don't want to ask questions in this setting, I'll be up here for a little bit. You guys can uh, come and ask them to me. I'll give you guys all my email address if you guys are interested at all. If you want like polite advice or SAT advice or applying to college advice, uh, my email is K-A-T-I-E dot Kim, K-I-M, at N-B-C, U-N-I dot com. Just tell me that you guys listened to my talk at this uh, conference, and I would be more than happy to uh, chat with you guys and answer, or try to answer whatever questions you guys might have. Um, I apologize if you guys email me in the next couple of weeks and I don't reply to you. I'm getting married in two weeks from today, so I'm not Is uh, you know kind of when things are to pick up. How many like seniors, juniors, sophomores, well, seniors, seniors? Yes. Okay. Juniors. So this is like when you guys are taking your exams, right? Okay. Sophomores.
and then brush it. Wow, you guys. Oh, you guys have such a long way to go, but kudos to you guys for being here and starting early. So anyways, uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you so much for, yeah. My email again is katie, K-A-T-I-E, dot Kim, K-I-M, at nbcuni.com. If you want to take a deep breath, you're all going to be fine. You're all going to get into college. You are all going to find a job. You will all make a difference. I promise you that. Thanks so much, guys.